Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and we are recapping the Viegas trial, which had an explosive verdict. With me, senior legal editor Ron Blitzer. Before we talk about the testimony we were just listening to, let's talk about that verdict. Have you ever seen a verdict like that here on the network? I can't say that I have. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, really uh, emotional cases on the network, but to see uh, the cheers in the audience and to see the defendant uh, collapse out of uh, He was emotion. literally brought to his knees. He was lit exactly uh, out of relief and just the emotion that rushed out of him after this ordeal that he's been going through since 1993. Uh, you know, first he had a trial that ended in a mistrial when the jury couldn't reach a decision. Right. Then he's convicted only to spend years in jail and then 18 have... 18 years. And then to that, then have that overturned and, and tossed out. Then he gets to go before the jury again, and finally an acquittal. It's and, really something to see. And, and then the background is, is he has a family now. He had a family that was rooting for him. Yeah. And it's, when you watch that verdict, you literally feel like you're at a sporting event, that the Yankees won. Yeah, this is this is someone. He was a 16-year-old kid when this whole whole thing began. Uh, he he was a, a teenager who got caught up in this. He was arrested, uh, pegged with double murder. Now he's acquitted. He is a grown man with a family of his own. To see uh, where he started and then where he ended up with all of this, you can just see through his reaction uh, just what this means to him. Right. And so in this retrial, just so the viewers are aware, a confession tape was not admissible and neither were jailhouse calls. So do you think that that affected the reasonable doubt burden in this case? Or do you think that really there just was a lack of evidence? Yeah. When, when you don't have uh, what had been a key piece of evidence, then that hurts the prosecution significantly because it had been determined uh, when the uh, previous conviction had been overturned that the confession that he gave to the police was coerced. And that was, uh, that whole idea was supported actually by the witness that we were just hearing from, uh, Hernandez, Jesse Hernandez. Uh, he had said, and this was in a previous ruling, that he himself had been accused by one of the detectives of killing one of the victims. Right. And he said that, that the detective yelled at him until he cried, and if the detective had kept going, he, he might, might have admitted, admitted to it. something he didn't do. That's so that really helped Viegas here to not have to uh, fight this anymore. All good points. So the initial, the, the second trial where there was a conviction was overturned for ineffective assistance of counsel, a claim of innocence, and for a confession that was allegedly coerced and given under threat. We're going to take a quick break. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Wow. I'm literally shedding tears watching that. You saw the emotion of him standing up so in fear of having to go back to prison where he spent 18 years. He's been out since it's been overturned. He's been with his family getting ready to stand a third trial. And you could see and feel the fear before he fell to his knees in complete gratitude of his chance. I'm literally about to cry. <laughs> um, Ron, before we throw to a clip, I just want to, I mean, you have a tear in your eye, too. <laughs> the viewers need to see this. This doesn't happen very often. What do you make of this? I mean, my goodness. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it, it's incredibly emotional. I mean, I'm a former prosecutor. Me too. And, uh, but to you know, see a defendant here get an acquittal like this is really something in just, it's, it's a moving display. I, you know, the, the support that he had in the courtroom, uh, you know, again, we were talking about just how much time has gone on. Uh, you know, it was 1993 that this all started. He was 16 years old. He's 41 now. He's married. He's a father. And he, his wife just had another kid. Yeah. Uh, he had spent all these years in, in prison before uh, his conviction had been overturned. He's going through all this again. He had been out. He had been... Uh, you know, he'd been out on bail pending the outcome of this trial. So he had uh, a taste of freedom. So he had he a really taste. knew what was at stake. Yeah. And he was, you know, practically in tears waiting for the verdict because he knew that he could end up back there or get another chance at freedom here. And when he heard the words not guilty, 
It was more that he could take. It literally knocked him to the ground. And you can understand why. And mm -hmm. you know, to see uh, his attorneys uh, holding, you know, him, holding up, him up. Both sides. And, yep. you know, and everyone behind him in the courtroom uh, you know, supporting him and cheering. It, it was a sight to behold. You know, and I think when someone um, has a claim of innocence, you are rooting for them. It's a, you know, you're rooting for them to succeed because if there is any kind of doubt or reasonable doubt, it's better to let them go. And when I was a prosecutor, I know that during jury selection in voir dire, any time you ask a potential juror or you ask the panel, would you rather let a a guilty man walk or put an innocent man away, everyone would say and raise their hand, they'd rather let a guilty man walk than put someone innocent behind bars. So this guy, Viegas, after 18 years sitting there behind bars for this crime, has a public vindication, which is something for him and his family, I'm sure even for his kids, to, it deletes the tarnish of of the accusations that he faced before this trial. Yeah, and you know, he may have you know been hopeful, more hopeful in this trial than he was in the previous ones just because it had already been decided that his confession had been coerced. So that was something that couldn't be used against him the way it had been in the past, but you still never know. He still had to face this other trial even though he had a positive ruling that set him free. He still needed to go through all of this again and to hear testimony against him again and to hear prosecutors give closing arguments vilifying him again. Yep. But after all that, it's all over and he can go home. He gets to go home. And that's the bottom line. Let's continue with testimony of Jesse Hernandez. This is the victim's friend. All of this is important because it leads up to what the verdict was. And listen carefully. He was a witness to the shooting, but he didn't ID the defendant. And there is reasonable doubt. Let's take a look. Thanks. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. That is testimony from Jesse Hernandez in the Viegas trial. This is a victim's friend, and he was an eyewitness to the shooting, but he did not ID the defendant. With me, senior legal editor Ron Blitzer, what is the significance of his testimony and the biggest takeaway points right now that we're listening to? Uh, well, just overall in his testimony, uh, you know, when you have, you know, a key witness, who can't identify a defendant, that's... But he could identify the victims. Right. So you can identify the victim. You can say you were there. You can paint the picture. But when the one thing... So that, you know, helps set up that, okay, this happened. Something happened. You can talk about, you know, the crime that was committed and describe the people who were, who were killed. But when what's missing is who was actually behind it, then the effectiveness of this witness as far as what the prosecution is trying to accomplish is very limited. And it's helpful for the defense when someone who was there, one of the few people who actually witnessed what was going on, can't actually say, this is the guy who did it. Right. And as you can see on the screen right now, in that shot, that's the defendant, and he is paying close attention to everything that's being said. Because remember, this is his third trial. The first one was a mistrial. The second one was a conviction. He spent 18 years behind bars, pe bars pending an appeal. When it was overturned on appeal, he was home with his family, waiting for this third trial with a real taste of freedom. Uh, let's talk about this a little more, because this witness is going to continue to testify because he was an eyewitness to the shooting. What key testimony do we need? For this to be a prosecution win, so when you have a when you have the prosecution having an eyewitness there, you need to you know even if you can't identify the uh, the defendant himself, you need to at least I mean because that's obviously what you what you're really going for. You want that dramatic moment in the courtroom where you're saying, "Is the person you saw here today? Can you point to him?" And you have that moment. You didn't have that here. So the best the prosecution can hope for is enough detail that still supports 
what the police's account was. So if everything else lined up with what law enforcement was saying, that still helps the prosecution. If there are inconsistencies, right. that's not good. But if they can back it up, that helps. Right. Or if there's another prosecution witness that can pick up where this witness left off, they could piece the shooting together. Exactly. And maybe they could pin it on the defendant. We'll see. We're going to continue to monitor this. We have to take a quick break. But after the break, we have another witness's testimony. Welcome back to Long Crime. I'm Carissa Kranz, and you are listening to some testimony from Juan Medina. He was an eyewitness to the 1993 shooting, which the defendant, Villegas, is standing trial for now for a third time. With me, senior legal editor Ron Blitzer. We just heard a few clips of his testimony. Next is going to be cross-examination. What is the significance of this witness? What are the takeaway points that we should know as viewers are trying to digest what he's saying, which is kind of in a monotone tone of voice? I even have a hard time picking out what's important and what's not because every answer is sort of on the same level when he talks. I don't hear much inflection. Yeah. So, you know, like the other witness we were listening to, Jesse Hernandez, uh, Medina was one of two eyewitnesses here. Uh, so they were there when the shooting happened. So they are you know, best useful to kind of paint the picture of what happened here. And if their accounts can line up with what police say, then that helps the prosecution. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. But what helps the defense and really, really makes uh, the prosecution's job extremely difficult in this case is that no one was able to positively ID the defendant, uh, you know, who, you know, none of the witnesses here were able to definitively point to Viegas as the guy who did this. Right. Uh, you know, we had talked about how Hernandez, the other eyewitness, had himself been accused at one point of right. killing one of the victims here. Right. Which, so, is, which is key. And then and also the the feeling of needing to even maybe admit to something they didn't do because the police was so, for, uh, you know, ex forceful in their interrogation. Yeah. And, you know, it really it makes me wonder uh, what the prosecution was thinking when they did decide to go forward with this third trial, because they didn't have to try Vegas again. You have the option. Right. They uh, the previous conviction had been overturned. And I understand, you know, this, you know, a lot of times, you know, we've seen in trials that we've covered on the Law and Crime Network that you have, you know, one mistrial, two mistrials, eventually prosecutors say, okay, enough. Here, it's a little bit different because you had a mistrial and then a conviction. But when your key evidence, when your confession, when you have uh, jail recordings uh, where he allegedly admitted to doing it, when none of that is allowed at trial and your eyewitnesses can't identify him. You don't really have that much like hard evidence you know, to go. And that's on. a good point. I wonder why the prosecution wouldn't have, or maybe they didn't. Maybe he didn't want to take it. Offered a time served plea in order to secure a conviction. Yeah, and also even with evidence, cases that are this old are difficult in the first place it's because you have, you have officers who may have retired in some cases. You have witnesses who may not be available right. anymore. People's memories change yep. even after testifying in previous trials. A lot goes on, and it's a lot, it's yeah, a lot more and difficult. and statements will change. They become inconsistent. We need to take a quick break, but we're going to continue following this trial, gavel to gavel, and then have more studio analysis in just a few minutes. So stick with us and come back with us on the other end. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and that is testimony of Juan Medina. He's an eyewitness to the shooting in the Viegas trial back in 1993. He's on cross-examination right now. That's what you just heard and saw. And the attorney was authenticating a statement back that he wrote a long time ago. With me, senior legal editor Ron Blitzer. What is some legal insight you can add to this based on his cross-examination? We just listened to direct examination. How's it going? What are we looking for? What's the bombshell piece of evidence that we need in order to secure a conviction in this trial versus a, another not guilty, another not, not another not guilty, versus a not guilty versus a, another mistrial hung jury? What is it that, that, that we need from this witness? Yeah, so... You know, we got, I think, what we needed from this witness. And when we were listening to the direct examination, uh, we talked about what stood out 
to me there, and I mentioned that he had said that it was dark. Uh, that's exactly what was brought up here during the cross-examination. Asked him, you said it was dark here, right? Yes. Um, you couldn't see who was firing the shots from inside the car, right? Yes. You heard the shots and you ran away. Yes. So that says it all right there, that the eyewitness... And the windows were tinted, the too. The windows were tinted and they couldn't tell who fired the shot. We've got to take a quick break. Stick with us. We'll be right back in just a few minutes.